Hey, thanks for joining us at Connection Point Church. You know, we would love for you to stay connected and a simple way for you to do that is to subscribe so that each week you can get notified when new content goes live. We'd also love to keep in touch with you throughout the week and the best way to do this is through our Connection Point Facebook page. Now with all that being said, let's go to this week's message with our lead pastor, Zach Maddox. Well, on this uh, Sunday before Christmas Day, uh, I'd like to consider the question of what is Christmas for? What is Christmas for? I'm sure you could come up with some different answers. So meet the person next to you. Introduce yourself. We, we encourage people to talk in church. Tell them. Give them your thoughts. What is Christmas for? Talk to a neighbor. If there's nobody next to you, slide up to next to somebody. All right, hopefully you came up with some good answers. What'd you come up with? What's Christmas for? What do we got? No one? No answers? Family. That's a good answer, Jay. Your mom would be proud. <laughs> yeah, Christmas is it's a great time to get together with family. What else? Jesus' birthday. All right. Praise God was, I think, a part of that. And, and cookies. <laughs> Amen. Probably had too many by this point. <laughs> Anything else? Traditions, yeah. Um, it's always interesting to talk with people and ask them what are some of their family traditions. It's interesting how varied those are. Um, that's usually a conversation point in marriage. Like you have your first Christmas and you're like, wait a minute, what should we, how do we blend those things? So that's great. Well, we want to look at a passage of scripture this morning that gets to the heart of what is Christmas all about? What is Christmas for? So if you have your Bibles, hey, I hope you've got God's word with you today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. I'll invite you to stand for the reading of God's word today. So Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Open middle, go right, you'll find it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Matthew chapter 2, a familiar passage. We're going to cover the first 12 verses this morning. So Matthew, he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. So Christmas can have a, a lot of different meanings for people. It might include Santa Claus and reindeer, or decorations and gifts, family meals and games, or maybe going to the movies. But whatever Christmas might mean to you, when it's all said and done, Christmas is for remembering the king has come. Christmas is for remembering the king has come. And as we look at this passage this morning, I want to unpack what it is, how we know that the king has come, and, and what the response to that should be. But the natural questions to ask out of this passage, and, and so many of us are so familiar with the Christmas story, sometimes we just kind of, okay, yeah, that's there. But have you ever asked the question, who are the wise men? And why in the world were these people from the East looking for the newborn king and the Jews? Like, those are good questions to ask, so I want to take a look at that first. So let me handle that question of who the wise men were. 
So the word wise men, it's better translated as magi. It's where our word magic comes from. And according to ancient historians, the magi were a tribe of people within the larger people group of the Medes. They were a hereditary priesthood tribe, somewhat like the Levites of Israel. So you're familiar with those. They had knowledge of astrology and astronomy, and and because of their priestly function and special knowledge, they maintained a place of tremendous prominence and significance in the East. They were key people in Eastern governments, almost like senators. The Magi were so powerful that historians tell us no Persian was ever able to become king except under two conditions. He had to master the scientific and religious discipline of the Magi, And he had to be approved of and crowned by the Magi. In short, the Magi were kingmakers. So that's what they were coming to do. Uh, We find the Magi in Scripture on a number of occasions in both the Old and the New Testaments. So in Esther, we see them called wise men. This is in Esther chapter 1, so that's part of the Old Testament. Remember, Esther was over in the east. And then in Jeremiah, we meet one called Rab Mag. In Acts chapter 8, we see Simon, Magus, the magician. And then later in Acts 13, we find Bar-Jesus or Elymas, which actually means wise men, the magician. But the most prominent and lengthy mention of the Magi in the Old Testament, it actually occurs in the book of Daniel. The Magi face extermination by Nebuchadnezzar for not being able to interpret a dream that the king has. But then they're rescued by Daniel because Daniel was given the interpretation by God. And afterward, here's what happens for Daniel. This is in Daniel chapter 2. Maybe you've not paid attention to this before, but this is going to answer a lot of questions for us about them. It says, Daniel was made ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men, over all the magi. So Daniel becomes the leader of these guys. And so because of the influence of Daniel and his friends, these guys begin anticipating the king of the Jews. Because of Daniel's position and influence over the Magi, this group is anticipating a newborn king hundreds of years after Daniel was there. What kind of influence is that? Isn't that extraordinary? I was thinking about that to think, man, would we have that kind of influence with the people we know? That we could encourage them so much and put such a, a, a joy in their hearts for this coming king that they would hundreds of years later, generations later, still be looking for him. These kingmakers from the east were searching for the king of the Jews. That's some incredible influence that Daniel and his friends had. So the question is, are we making people in our lives curious about the king? Something to consider this Christmas holiday. Now, what was showing the wise men, the magi, the way to Jesus? What was it? What was that symbol? Some of you maybe have it atop your Christmas tree. A star. What what about this star? What was it really? I want us to look back at at verse 9 and let's look at the description of this star. It says, after this interview, so after the wise men meet with Herod, the wise men went on their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. That's a pretty interesting star. Stars don't typically move. Comets might, but I don't know how it stops over a house, right? So it's interesting. This star that guided the Magi to where Jesus was, it was the visible manifestation of the glory of God. That's what it was. Think about Old Testament, that pillar of fire that leads the Israelites in the wilderness. It's the glory of God, and now maybe it took the form of a star, something that the the wise men could recognize, But it was the glory of God leading them. What's it say? As they saw the star with exceeding joy. That's what the glory of the Lord should do to our hearts when we encounter it, when we see it. So this star leads them. And here's the thing. This star, God's glory, it rose in such a way over the home where Jesus was that magi a thousand miles away could see it and would follow it We're drawn to it because of the influence of Daniel and his friends. Hundreds of years later, they're pursuing this newborn king. And the glory of the Lord is showing them the way. But now here's the sad thing. Jerusalem is only four miles from Bethlehem. It really is like a huff, skip, and a jump. And the leaders in Jerusalem, that same glory was there. They couldn't see it. 
And the question is, why? And I would say it's because they weren't looking for it. They didn't want a new king. The leadership in Jerusalem, Herod and others, our passage says everyone in Jerusalem was bothered by the fact that these magi came and were telling them, where's the newborn king? They were bothered because they liked being in power. They liked being their own authority. And so they couldn't see the glory of God on display in a village four miles down the road. But magi who were pursuing king, they could see it a thousand miles away. The king has come. And so the question this morning is, who in your life will seek him because of your influence? His glory is here and he's guiding us. And the question is, have we seen him? Are you seeking him? If not, it's time to seek the king who's come. It's time to desire him more than ourselves. It's time to want his rulership over our self-rule. The king has come. And what does this king deserve? He deserves our costly worship. Jesus, our king, he deserves our costly worship. So these magi, they travel a thousand miles from southern Arabia. That's where they they were at Southern Arabia to travel a thousand miles to see Jesus. And now we, by Christian tradition, think it was just three guys on camels with lots of gifts, right? Well, I can tell you right now, if it was three guys on camels going through the desert, they would have been robbed and left for dead and they would not be in our Christmas story. <laughs> it would have never made it. So that's just Christmas, Christian tradition that we think that there was, you know, three gifts named, so then it's three wise men. What they actually, history would show, if you go back and look at the history, is it would have been at least... 12 wise men, and they would have traveled with like a thousand troops. So if you want to know why Jerusalem was bothered, a thousand troops roll into town and 12 of these guys who are kingmakers say, where's a newborn king? Herod and these guys are bothered. (laughs) They're really concerned. They roll into town and they're going to be noticed. If it was just three guys on a camel, they would have passed right on through town. So these guys are traveling a thousand miles with about a thousand people. Okay, that's some pretty costly worship, all in pursuit of this newborn king. And then they show up with these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And these are luxury gifts fit for a king. They're costly gifts given after costly travel. The king deserves costly worship. Verse 11 from our passage, here's what it says. They entered the house these magi, and they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When you understand who Jesus is, you can't help but to want to worship him. These magi travel a thousand miles with hundreds of people through tough terrain, hoping, just on a hope, to see the newborn king. They didn't know what they were going to encounter once they got there. And then when they finally get to see him, they can't help but to bow down and worship him. There seemed to be no other appropriate response because the king that they had been waiting for had finally come. The king is here and the glory of God rested upon him. When we pursue Jesus with hopes of encountering him, when we gather together and enter into his presence, you know, we've talked a lot about Sunday mornings. What are Sunday mornings for? And a big part is that we can collectively create an environment of guaranteed places of encounter with Jesus. We find this in Scripture. It says that where two or three are gathered, what Scripture say? He's here in our midst. As soon as you bump into somebody in guest services, they're welcoming you at the door. You've encountered Jesus. Isn't that awesome? And you think about how we sing our praises and it says that, that he's enthroned on the praises of his people. So maybe the balcony is the best place to be. Like you can go up there with God too. I don't know. But you think about those scriptures and it says even in giving that God supplies seed to the sower that he shows up in our giving when we're faithful to him. All of these as guaranteed place of encounter. Communion that he was known to them in the breaking of bread. In prayer that his ear is inclined to hear our prayers. So what we've done is we've basically put together this collective environment of experiencing Jesus, of engaging in his presence. That's why we gather on a Sunday. And the question is, once we've met him, what do we do with that? Because encountering the king is what it's all about. We gather on a Sunday morning to enter into guaranteed places of encounter with Jesus. And when we encounter Jesus, it should cause us to worship, to do something different than to simply go through the motions. 
because it's Jesus that we're after. The Magi couldn't help but respond, and neither should we. It might cause us to raise our hands, even when it seems odd, or it might cause us to take next steps in giving, because to be selfish is natural. To be generous is supernatural. But no matter what the response is, worship should cost you something. Because worship that doesn't cost you something isn't worship, it's just routine and predictable behavior. It's doing what you've always done, which I'll tell you results in what you've always got. It shouldn't be the case, though, because when we encounter the king, we should respond, and when we encounter the king, it changes us. When we give King Jesus the costly worship he deserves, he changes us. That's the last thing we find in our passage, that Jesus, our king, changes us. When it came time for the Magi to leave from their encounter with Jesus, verse 12 tells us that they returned to their own country by another route. Now, it's helpful to understand, so the New Testament book of Matthew is written to a a Jewish population, that Matthew, what he's trying to build a case for is that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. He is the Messiah, the long-awaited one. And, And so when the Jewish audience hears that these wise men went home another way, here's what they're thinking. Because when you would go to the temple, and some of you have gone to to Jerusalem with us, and if you go to the temple and you visit the south steps, there's this entrance over here to the left, which is how you would go into the temple. And then when you would go and encounter God, you would come out on the right. Why? Because when you encounter God, you're not the same, and so you leave a different way. So for these wise men, these magi, when it says that they went a different way, yes, it was in a dream, that God warned them, don't go back to Herod. But what the Jewish audience would have understood is they went another way because they encountered the king. And when you encounter the king, you're not the same. And that's what it should be for us on a Sunday morning. As we talked about, we, we gather to scatter. We gather to encounter King Jesus, to be in his presence, and we scatter so that we can take that presence elsewhere. And when we scatter, we're changed because we met him. So when we encounter the king who has come, He changes us. The benefit of our costly worship is it results in us being changed. When we give a sacrifice of praise by raising our hands, it changes us because it frees us from caring about what other people think. You ever been that way? You're like, like, I'd kind of like to raise my hands. I don't know what other people are going to think about that. And then you raise your hands and Jesus says, who cares what other people think about that? Like you're freed from things. There's something that happens in worship that frees you from the things that inhibit you in life. Jesus says, I came to set you free. It's the same thing that happens with giving. I I shared a couple of weeks ago, the reason most people don't give is because of fear. And guess how you overcome that fear? You give, and you realize God's got you. That's how it is. When we give God our costly worship, he frees us to live the life he's always wanted us to live. So the next time we sing a song, maybe raise your hands. Be changed by Jesus. The next time an offering bucket passes you by, drop something in and begin to loosen the grip that fear has on your life. The king has come. So let's worship and be changed by him. Christmas really is for remembering that our king has come. Christmas is for remembering that this king deserves our costly worship. And Christmas is for knowing when we give our king costly worship, he changes us. Christmas is about King Jesus changing us as we encounter him. That's why it's a privilege that we get to gather this way. So have you encountered Jesus? Have you been changed by him? It's his desire to change your life, so will you seek him for it? Will you worship him and begin to see your life change? I'd like to invite you to stand as we close in song this morning. I want to go back to that point for just a moment about that that star, that glory of the Lord. We understand that by the time the Magi got to Jesus, he was probably about one or two years old. So what that means is for a year or two, the people in Jerusalem, the leadership in Jerusalem, had the glory of God miles away, and they missed it because they weren't seeking it. How near is Jesus right now to us, and are you missing it because you're not seeking it? Let's seek Jesus this morning. He's here. Are you seeking the glory of the Lord and his guidance in your life? It's his desire to guide you and guide you well. So maybe you're here this morning and and you would say, I want to encounter Jesus and do so in a a fresh way today. Shelly and I were talking after the the first service about that thousand mile journey. We're all on a journey. And sometimes that journey can make you tired. But if you go and meet Jesus and give him your costly worship, 
It's his desire to change you and help you leave restored. So will we do that as we close in song this morning? But maybe you're here and you've, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus that, that that's kind of a, a new thought or, or something to, to follow after. And, but today you'd say, I want to follow Jesus and encounter him like that. I want to walk away changed because the only way to walk away changed is for you to surrender your life to him. So with every head bowed in this room, who here today would say, I want to I want to follow Jesus. I want to encounter him this Christmas in a way I've never had opportunity to before. Who here today would say, that's me. I want to follow Jesus today. I want to devote my life to him. Give him the costly worship of my life and surrender to him in that way. Jesus, we just thank you that you came. God, I thank you that you gave your best, that you sent us a king who would rule rightly and could do what we could not. And so, God, I just pray that you would help us to truly surrender our lives to him in every way, that we'd hold nothing back. That, Lord, where there's fear and anxiety, that we, we release it to, to the king, knowing he's got all things in his hands. So, Jesus, help us today as we close in song to give you a sacrifice of praise. Lord, maybe we raise our hands in response to the fact that you've come. And, Lord, knowing that as we give you our costly worship, that we truly are changed by you, that we walk away different. And that's the joy of coming together to gather in this way. Lord, I pray for each and every one in this room. I pray, Lord, as they go this week to visit with family and friends for this Christmas holiday, I pray, Jesus, that they would meditate and reflect on the fact that you have come, that you deserve our costly worship, and as we give it to you, we're changed. Jesus, I I pray, Lord, that our lives uh, would be dedicated to you and your glory. And Lord, I pray that our lives would truly influence others to seek you too. What a, what a tremendous testimony of Daniel that hundreds of years later, his life was impacting a people group. And so, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.